Welcome to the big Arabic day of UNL, the annual day of the Arabic studies program. My name is Lehussein Saidu. I am a foreign language teaching assistant in the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures. This year, I joined the program as a Fulbright teaching assistant by teaching first year Arabic classes throughout uh, fall and spring semesters. It was and it is a wonderful experience as I learned a lot about the cultural diversity here at UNL, and I learned a lot by teaching, and I also enjoyed teaching one of the most beautiful languages in the world, Arabic. I consider myself one of the luckiest for writers by coming here to, to UNL. Uh, it's just amazing to have a great advisor and coordinator, Dr. Abla Hassan, very hardworking students, and very helpful colleague, Yes, Senior Fisa. Thank you all. Many thanks to all those who made this event possible. Uh, many thanks to Michael Mason, Faisal Ali, Hamdan, and many thanks to the support and fund provided by Professor Patty Simpson, the chair of the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures. Today, we had a full day of fun as well as educational workshops. We enjoyed an Arabic calligraphy workshop and an Arabic music and singing workshop. Now, it's my honor to introduce the main event of the day, a panel discussion moderated by Dr. Adam Thompson. Before I introduce Dr. Adam, let me please remind you to stay with us for a lottery at the end of the panel dis discussion. Let's now take a quick look at what 2017 looked like. Let's join me please in watching a short picture documentation about our amazing 2017.
Our panel today will highlight a UK research project that joined the Arab section, the Spanish section, the, Germanic, the German section, all from the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures in documenting and honoring the distinguished Arabic, German, and Spanish speaking heritage communities of Nebraska. First, let me introduce our panel moderator, Dr. Adam Thompson. Dr. Adam Thompson is the assistant director at the Kotak Center for the Teaching and Study of Applied Ethics and is a visiting instructor in the Department of Philosophy. His primary research interests lie in the areas of individual and collective responsibility, moral psychology, normative and applied ethics, social, political philosophy, philosophy of education, and how to teach philosophy and critical thinking. Beyond the academy, Adam is invested in social political activism, exploring the outdoors and music, and supporting his partner's work as an LPS elementary school principal, and learning from his puppy. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Dr. Adam Thompson. adversity to live the American dream. While some dream of better economic conditions, others dream of dignity, freedom of speech, gender equality, social justice, and so on. Over the course of the past 100 plus years, Germans, Latinx, Arab, and Muslim immigrants have brought to Nebraska their dreams, passions, languages, traditions, and even their cuisine. In the process, they have reshaped them as they have become American or Mormon. In this research uh, that will be presented, or that we'll be talking about, uh, three bilingual UNL students collaborated under the supervision of UNL faculty on a project highlighting the many contributions these immigrants brought to Nebraska, to brought to Nebraska. One of the many outcomes of this project is a 10 minute YouTube video that each will use as a visual documentation to illustrate what the American dream meant for members of Arabic, German, and Spanish-speaking communities of Lincoln. Today, we will learn from the team about the process so far, their proposal, their challenges, their interviews, their research, their travel across Nebraska, and the actual journey of making the project. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce the uh, panelists. <coughs> Um, Dr. Christina Brantner. Uh, Dr. Brantner uh, is associate professor of German and former director of women's studies at UNL. Uh, Dr. Brantner was born in the dark woods of the Black Forest, Germany, and transplanted herself to the prairie in 1987. Since then, she adopted two sons, created a study abroad program for UNL in Berlin, Germany, and loves to interweave her life with fellow immigrants in the uh, Nebraska Navy. Uh, next, we have Dr. Isabel Velasquez. Uh, Dr. Velasquez is Associate Professor of Spanish in the Department of Modern Languages. She was born on the Mexico-US border, and when she was 10, she used to play Little House on the Prairie while looking at the Pacific Ocean. She researches the social dimensions of multilingual experience, and she can ask for good coffee in five languages. <laughs> Something I would love to. Um, she can swear, oh, and she can swear semi-confidently in three. <laughs> I didn't see that. <laughs> I'd take that class. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, Dr. Abla Hassan. Uh, Dr. Hassan is assistant professor of practice of Arabic language and culture and the undergraduate advisor 
uh, for the Arabic Studies Program at UNO. Her current teaching and research interests include Islamic feminism, love and sexuality, and Arabic culture and Quranic studies. And uh, she is mother of three boys. Uh, the student team. Rizeda Sabaymas is a sophomore and double major in human development and family sciences in Spanish uh, with a minor in education. She is bilingual in Spanish and English. Next we have Barrera Iqbal. Uh, she is a biology major with a pre-optometry focus. Uh, she crossed something out for me. <laughs> She participates in the Arabic Youth Council and is bilingual in Urdu and English. And then we have, finally we have um, Lindsay Labrie. Uh, Lindsay is a double major in German and Global Studies. She spent a gap year in Germany and is bilingual in English and German. She is a member of the UNL marching band. Oh, that's it. She is a member of the UNL marching band. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh, and before we start the conversation, we're going to show uh, a UCARE uh, PowerPoint video. I was told uh, you were the first to suggest to your colleagues the idea of a shared you care project. Uh, where did the idea come from? Uh, what was the motivation for it? And uh, why now? Well, first of all, thank you for coming 
here and listening to our story that we're excited to share with you. Um, it was about a year ago um, when I was thinking that the country that I came to, the United States, from my home country, Germany, was undergoing some change and I was thinking there might be a need to remind ourselves in Nebraska where this all came from. There were people here, but then there were always waves of people coming. And in modern languages, we have so many different groups um, from so many cultures and languages. So why not band together and kind of look at what were some waves of immigrants coming to Nebraska where we temporarily have our home. And so I looked around and thought, oh my goodness, um, there were waves of Germans coming to the state and there were later waves. So what could be similar or dissimilar in those waves? And with these great colleagues that I have, let's see if we can find something that interests us and that we can share with um, the rest of the state. That's basically what it was. Great. Um, and Isabel, uh, what makes studying the Spanish-speaking heritage communities in Nebraska a multi-layer research project uh, as opposed to a uh, mm -hmm. mono-layered one? Uh, and can you tell us more about the difficulties embodied in such a research and uh, which uh, epistemic and practical tools any scholar will need uh, to know for conducting such research? I think that the difficulties are precisely what make, makes it more interesting. Um, Spanish, unlike other heritage languages in the U.S., has a community of 40 million speakers, and yet um, we speak different varieties of Spanish, we have different histories, so there's great intra-community variation. In a state like Nebraska, where um, there is not a lot of high ethno-linguistic vitality, it has always uh, interested me to know why Spanish is maintained and spoken, even though people could carry out their life in English. So you choose to maintain your language because you choose to maintain a part of you. And that has been always, has always been fascinating. At least to me. <laughs> Great. Uh, Abla, uh, part of research in the Arabic heritage community of Nebraska started from an email. Um, tell us more about the story and in what ways does this story challenge what we know about uh, Arabs in the U.S. and in Nebraska? I'm going to have to steal your mic first. Uh, so um, uh, where did we start in the UK program, in the UK research, uh, the part of the Arabic heritage? Uh, so I had like um, almost a year ago this email from someone who emailed me that they visited uh, Carney Cemetery and uh, they took a picture of uh, a gravestone with Arabic calligraphy. They were just curious, what, what does it say? And uh, what caught my attention, not only that, uh, some, some by the way we, 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 we gave a visit there, uh, some of the gravestones there are written in Arabic and English, and some are just written in Arabic, just Arabic. So what uh, got my attention was not only the, the name, but the date. So the date was 1910. Uh, this is a new even to me. So when we started with, with the team, and Barira told me she's interested in investigating the Arabic heritage in Nebraska, I thought that would be the uh, best way to start from. Um, and um, not to ruin the surprise, there are so many interesting points in the way she started, Barira, from one email, one uh, picture, to locating the family, the immigrant family that came here, like those people who lived here and uh, died 1910. Uh, so 
the uh, and to anticipate a little bit what our project will will end with or end uh, supporting. Uh, so finding you know such great history of Arabs in Nebraska uh, make us reconsider the way of we think of immigrants in Nebraska, because all these questions, current questions about which should we accept immigrants to Nebraska or not? Could they be able to assimilate? Do they have anything important to share? Can they be a part of the uh, American fabric or the Nebraskan fabric? All these questions just turned redundant because we had all these people, pioneer immigrants, who already answered those questions. Uh, the Sheda family, who uh, opened their, their homes and their hearts to us, and Barira will tell you more about that, and uh, invited us to tell, to let, to tell us the, the, their family story, is just one example of so many other stories of immigrant success in Nebraska. Therefore, understanding more about that make us understand more what, what does it mean to be Nebraskan in the first place. The questions we keep asking ourselves about immigrants uh, it, it reflects nothing when we do such kind of research other than our own ignorance of our own history. And uh, I, I'd like to switch to Berira to tell you what she did with this single email I gave it to her, and that picture, she did a great job in terms of you know, putting together a full story, or the full story. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna give it to Berira. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Dr. Alba. All right, hello everybody, thank you so much for coming today. So my research process began when Dr. Abla gave me this email. And she's like, Barrera, there's a story there. Go find it. And I'm like, of course, Dr. Abla, whatever you want. So off I went and watched Netflix instead. But it's afterwards, afterwards, though. Um, in that email, there were two clues. The first clue being that there's Arabic inscriptions in the cemeteries in Kearney. And there's a church called the St. George Orthodox Christian Church that would be connected to those cemeteries as well. So I decided to go further into that history of that church and found out that their original name was the St. George Syrian Orthodox Church. So I was like, hmm, interesting. So I decided to use that name and cross-referenced it with the public death records of the Kearney Cemetery and found 23 individual hits. So I'm like, okay, so these individuals are associated with the Syrian Orthodox Church, but where's the real Arabic connection? And I didn't want to go all the way to Kearney in the winter to into the graveyards. <laughs> no, it's too cold. So I decided to see if I can Google image uh, to see these gravestones, to see that Arabic evidence proof. And I found out that uh, there's actually a big uh, public cemetery database that actually does that for you. So after I cataloged the birth, the how these individuals died and then how they died, or when they died and how they died. Um, I put enter their names into that database and up came uh, like 18 cemetery gravestones that actually had those in, uh, Arabic inscriptions. So I'm like, okay, there's my Arabic connection, but how do I know more about these families? So I decided to like individually just Google their names. And one of the biggest main con uh, connection that these uh, families, the, they had, was uh, they're actually from Lebanon. And they actually immigrated to America due to economic depression. These uh, are the big families, they're called the Sheda family, the Jacobs, the Yaqubs, the Yanis as well. So I presented, I told Dr. Abla, and she was like, mm, fascinating. Find me a descendant of these uh, uh, families, okay? And I'm like, okay, I will go find you a descendant now. So that's when one of my biggest uh, hurdles came because one of my uh, recent articles of those families dated back to the 1980, like around 1983, and that's like over 30 years ago, and a lot has happened during that time. So I called around uh, into museums to see if I can locate the authors. That was a dead end. So one day, I was back on Facebook, and I was scrolling, and one of my old friends, uh, her grandfather was in hospice care. And if you're put in hospice care, uh, the patient usually has like around six months to live. So once in a while, she would uh, update the statuses of her grandfather. And one day, he passed away in early January. And so she wrote this really nice eulogy of him on Facebook. And I decided to like read the whole thing. And one of the lines that uh, she said was, um, you're going to have the biggest Shada family reunion up in heaven. And I was like, uh, I think that's one of my names. So I opened up all those um, articles, and I found uh, the Shida name, 
I didn't know if they were actually connected. So I constructed a really rough genealogy based on what the articles were telling me and um, cross-referencing it with her grandfather's um, obituary. And uh, doing that, just really rough genealogy, there was an exact match. So I decided to um, message her and her grandfather's uh, Funeral was on Thursday, and I did like a really rough interview with her on Sunday. So it was like really close, and she was like she was really close with him as well. So like we, we might have cried a little bit, but um, I would say the rest would be history. Then we went off to Carney and uh, interviewed the grandmother, the great uncle, and her mother as well. As Abla said, <laughs> um, uh, Lindsay, uh, what motivated you to take up this challenge uh, to work on a UCARE project on top of a full load of classes? Uh, how did you end up picking the small town of Eustis as, uh, as your example? And lastly, what kind of recommendation would you have uh, for students in the audience? Uh, should they uh, do or want to do a UCARE project and why? Okay, so um, Christina kind of picked me um, out of the crowd, out of her German students to um, be the leader on the, the German part of this project. And um, I think part of the reason why um, I seem to be a good candidate is because of my experience with the German language and I lived in Germany for an entire year. Um, I went through the process of, okay, I had to get my German visa and I had to go there not knowing the language very well assimilate and then come home and reassimilate back to the American culture um, and because of that I got to see the differences between the German and the American culture firsthand um, and that really helped me with my research here back in Nebraska because I could understand what the people who we were interviewing went through um, so that was like one of the really big things that inspired me for this project and that that I'm glad I did because now I can see what the people on the Nebraskan side of the immigration waves felt and what they went through. Um, and it was actually kind of traumatizing for the people that came over here that we interviewed. They came over in the 1960s because the father was in the army. He met this woman at a club and she didn't speak any English and he didn't speak any German. And somehow they hit it off and like they used their hands to talk or whatever. And, um, and um, the woman already had two small children and the man said, I'll give you 15 minutes to marry me. So. They married each other, they came back, the father came back on a plane, the mother came back on a boat for 10 days with her two small children, knowing no English, learning how to say cornflakes, and that's about it. And um, it was traumatizing for the, for the little children that, that came along, and it still is traumatizing to this day. Um, and it just shows that everyday people, they have this background that you don't know about, and it's the thing that makes us Nebraskan, and the, this common experience that all of our all of our ancestors probably for the German side have gone through this too as well so it's really important to see those connections like in person so that was part that inspired me the second part of the question was yeah um how did you end up picking that small town uh, oh Eustis yes and, so uh, um I picked Eustis because I was researching this German side of Nebraska, and it said in a Nebraska Life article that Eustis had a sausage factory and a Christmas um, celebration every year. They have a sausage festival. They have a German store. So I was like, okay, well, this place is obviously pretty packed with German heritage. So I got on, onto Facebook and I messaged the town of Eustis. The town of Eustis has a Facebook page, <laughs> a town of 300 people. I wonder if all 300 of them are members, but, <laughs> um, and then like within the hour, they were like, yeah, we'll help you with whatever you need. So they connected me to the owner of the grocery store and the owner of the Christmas shop, um, or the Der Deutsche Markt, the German market. And um, yeah, we got together and um, we went on this huge trip everywhere. We started in Grand Island, went to Kearney, then we went to um, Eustis during that day. So yeah, that's how I picked that family. And then the last part was, do I recommend? Any recommendations? Okay, so if you have a passion, um, like my passion is pretty obviously German, um, you should definitely 
try to find somebody else who has that passion as you, find a professor that has the same passion. It doesn't have to be about the humanities, it can be about science, whatever. Um, and make sure you make a connection with people. And if you like, feel like you want to do some kind of research just to broaden your knowledge or to become a more well-rounded person, you should definitely do it. It's not too, ba too big of a time commitment. Plus it's paid, so, you know. <laughs> Great. Uh, Rosanna, um, what have you learned about yourself as a multilingual uh, Latina while researching the stories you've collected uh, for this project? And in your opinion, uh, what are some aspects of Latina, uh, excuse me, Latino, Latina experience in Nebraska that people who are unfamiliar with our state uh, might not know? Um, I've always been better with writing, so I'm gonna read a little um, excerpt that I wrote earlier today in response to this question. Um, <laughs> um, for the past few years, I've struggled with my positions on certain social issues. I've been in and out of the immigration system in a process that took about 12 years. I've always considered myself to be pro-immigration and to be on the side that understands why people come to this country. But regardless of my experiences and the experiences of family members and friends I've come to know, I would always bring myself back to this place of uncertainty and, think that, and I think that is caused by the negative comments and counter arguments I hear from others. What if we, those immigrants here, are on the so-called wrong side of history? What if those comments we see, that we are not hardworking, that we seek the easy way out, that we are taking away the opportunities of others are true and we just don't see that? I constantly have this debate in my head between the two positions. But after doing this project and learning the history of not only the multilingual Latino experience, but also the experiences of Arabic and German speakers, that we are not on the wrong side. That we do not come here to steal opportunities or because it is easier. We have faced violence, poverty, and limited resources in our home countries. And all the people I interviewed taught me to not be ashamed of our stories or experiences. To not feel guilty for simply wanting a better future. Those who oppose us do it because they may not understand our past. Because of this project, I am now more confident, focused, and determined to succeed and be an advocate for all those who feel the way I did because of what we are taught to see ourselves, and I'm very thankful that I had that opportunity. Um, um, and for the second portion that focuses on the aspects of Latino experiences in Nebraska, um, I think People probably assume that the Midwest is not that diverse. Um, I certainly met a lot of people who think that. Um, and I do think that it is diverse. We have people from many different countries. But it is very easy, even in a place, I mean, no matter where you live, but in Nebraska, that even if we have a lot of people from different countries, we can easily seclude ourselves. Um, living in Grand Island, they have a very large Latino population. But that's all I ever came to know, living there for 12 years. Um, and it wasn't until I came here to Lincoln that I met um, the professors, that I met the other students, that I actually began learning more about Arabic culture and German culture as well. Um, so no matter where you are, and here in Nebraska, I mean, even in places like Omaha, you can have the south part, which people typically associate with Latinos, um, the northern part, which people typically associate with African-American communities. And it's very hard for those two to share spaces. So I think this project is a way to open up that discussion and a dialogue between people of all different countries and find those similarities together. And, and give our panelists a hand. Thank you very much.